Hey guys, Mr. B here, bringing you another math video. This is basically just an extension of the last one that I did um, on solving trigonometric equations. I didn't have much time, it was 12 minutes already, so um, we're just going to go through another example. This one's slightly different. So the biggest difference between this example and the previous one is, in the last one, it asks us to do a piecewise function to represent the general solution for all theta. In this one, it gives us a range. So by far, the easier one is the general solution, the piecewise function, because you don't have to worry about actually computing additional solutions, whereas in this one, you really need to worry about it. So let me just get a pen here on a go. So the first thing we need to do that's different from the last one that we just did is that this thing is not solved for the trigonometric function. So let's do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. So I end up with, and I'm just going to write it over here, so 5 cos, and you got that big old mess inside. And again, we're not actually graphing this thing, so you don't have to do anything with that mess right at the moment. That equals negative 1, then divide by 5, just like that. Okay, end up with cos, 2 theta minus pi over 2, and that equals negative 1 over 5. So that's basically our trigonometric function ready to be solved. So what I like to do is I like to sub out this m. So I'll write up here, my m is equal to that mess up there. So 2 theta minus pi over 2. Makes life a lot easier, and we could have done that at the beginning if we wanted to, so then we wouldn't have to continuously keep writing it. So cos m equals negative 1 over 2. So now I can go ahead and do my cast rule, do my um, quadrants. So I do MR. I'm looking for the reference angle again. Anytime you want to find the reference angle, you got to make sure that you put the R there to know that's the reference angle. It's not necessarily a solution. It's not an M value. It's a reference angle to the angle M. And again, inside my inverse trigonometric function, this must be a plus, all right? So this is not going to give us a, an exact value of radians with pi in it. It's going to give us something, some decimal, which is fine. We'll work with it. So it gives us, I'm going to leave two decimal places, 1.37 radians. So some students actually like to work, write the word radians after that when they got a decimal just to make sure they don't confuse that they're still working radians. So that's my m value. So now I go to the quadrant. So cos is negative. So that puts me in Q2 and in Q3. So in Q2, my rule is um, m equals pi minus uh, mr. And in Q3, m equals pi plus mr. Now, if you're just watching this one, I never watched the video before. I'll just skim back real quick. You can also go back and watch that video. Um, this is the cast rule, and basically it tells us where things are positive, what trigonometric ratios are positive, and what quadrants. So, C A S T. Cos is positive in Q uh, four. Everything is positive in Q one. Sine is in Q two, and tan is in Q three. So we're looking for where cos is negative. So it must be in where sine and tan is positive. Right? So the other ones are all negative, so cos would be one of those other ones. So that's why I chose those rules, and the, and the, the reference angle rules are there with it. So we got pi minus 1.37, and then pi plus 1.37. So I'll just quickly do those on my calculator. So pi minus 1.37 is going to give us 1.77. And then pi plus 1.37 is going to give us 4.51. So that's my two values of m, not 7, 1. So now what we need to do with those things, oops. Now what we need to do with those things is go ahead and solve for my actual value of theta. So theta is hidden in that mess up here 
right? 2 pi minus um, pi over 2. So I'm going to take each one of those values for m and sub it in here for m to solve for theta. Because theta is the solution I want. I'm trying to solve theta is in the original question. So 1.77 equals 2 theta minus pi over 2. So I'll do this exact same steps as you would solve in a linear equation. Try to get the theta by itself. So you add pi over 2 to both sides, just like that. I'll just quickly add that together now, 1.77 plus pi over 2. And I end up with 3.34 equals 2 theta. Divide both sides by 2. Theta equals, let's see what that gives us. 1.67. So that's my first solution. All right. From the cast rule. Now the second solution is going to be the same idea. 5.41 is my second m value. And then 2 theta minus pi over 2. So that giant mess there again. So same step. Subtract or add pi over 2 to both sides. So I go 4.51 plus pi over 2. Oops. I messed up with my Casio. And that gives me 6.08. Equal to 2 theta. Divide by 2. And then I end up with some pretty little mess, 3.04. All right. So those are my two theta values that the cast rule gives me. The cast rule will generally give me two values. So now I need to recognize that the thing that makes these transformational questions a little bit complicated is that they have B values, besides the fact that there's a giant mess inside there. So this B value is 2. And generally, what that means is we are going to have more solutions in a shorter um, in a shorter domain because it repeats more often. Okay, it changes our period. So we remember the formula: period is equal to two pi divided by the b value. So two pi divided by the b value, which is two, gives us a period of two pi. So we're going to have repeated solutions in between 0 and 2 pi because of this short domain. Normally, when we're solving the b value is 1, we'd be done now because there's not going to be any additional solution between 0 and 2 pi. But now this cos function has a period of pi, so that means it repeats twice in this amount of time. So we would expect that there would be at least another two solutions. So what I do when I'm generally doing this is that I recognize that that, that 2 pi is about you know twice 3.14 so it's about 6.28 especially when I have decimals like this it makes life a lot easier to compare the decimals so if I want to find the additional solutions what I have to do is I have to add and subtract 2 pi and see if it's within this um, 0 to 6.28 so obviously if I subtract off pi from both of these it's going to be below 0 so that's no good so my additional solution is just going to come from adding pi to both of these. So I'll add plus 3.14. Well, I'll actually add the pi. I'll just add the pi button in my calculator. So add pi. So let's see. 1.67 plus pi. And that's 4.81. And that's below my 6.28. But if I added it again, just for the sake of argument, I get 7.95. So that's not going to help me. So this guy right here, 3.04, I'm going to add pi. So 3.04 plus pi, 6.18. And that's below my 6.28 cutoff, just below. So if obviously if I added another pi, I would bust that. So that gives us four solutions to this equation. All right. So you can see how that B value 
definitely changes the number of solutions. So if this B value gets high, it really, really messes with how many solutions you could get. And generally my rule that for every two pi, if I multiply this B value by two, it'll tell me how many solutions I get. So it won't always work, but it'll sometimes work. So for example, my B value is two for this one. So if I multiply my B value by two, I get four solutions. If my B value was three, I would have three times two, approximately six solutions for every two pi. So that doesn't always work, but it works for good B values like two, three, four, five, six. Um, but uh, generally teachers are not gonna ask you. I wouldn't think anything higher than three or four. Two is a good one I like to use. All right, so that hopefully that helps. Um, definitely something you need to know for this course and uh, like, subscribe, share, all that stuff. And uh, thanks for watching and I'll see everybody in class hopefully soon. We're in quarantine. See ya.